Hello, I'm Irene Natividad, President of the Global Summit of Women, which is a business and economic forum for women that's now celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Now, over the years, the majority of our participants who come from 60 to 80 countries each year are corporate leaders or they are entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs from every corner of the world. Maybe some of you don't know this, but now a third of small business owners globally are women. And that wasn't always the case. So why is that fact important? Because small business underlies every economy in the world, including my country, the United States. If small businesses fail all over the world, economies would fail. So uh, the description, however, of small business varies from country to country. Uh, I told you it's 30%. If you were to count the woman who sells vegetable in the market, and that is her business, a micro enterprise it's called, that percentage is probably much bigger. Now, during the pandemic, a lot of small businesses have been hurt, whether women owned, male owned, it didn't matter. But women's businesses tend to be smaller and they have been far more seriously hurt. And so today's program, we decided to focus on women-owned businesses. They are substantial businesses, they're not tiny, but they will give you lessons that I hope you will learn as you figure out what to do during this very difficult period. I also wanted you to meet these overachievers. They're all incredible, all four of them. Uh, and it's always good to hear other people's stories women who have started their own enterprises. So not to waste time, I'd like to begin with one of them. Let me introduce to you Anusha Oskuya. Uh, she is born, she was born in Iran uh, and came to the United States when she was 14 uh, and thrived, went to school. And then now she is the CEO of a company that's called Ship and Shore Environmental. Basically, she took 20 years ago, she took a metal fabricating company and reinvented it, transformed it, so that it became an air pollution abatement company, uh, basically uh, working with other uh, manufacturing and industrial companies to reduce uh, their impact on the atmosphere. So rather than talk about this, let me show you her video. For two decades, Ship and Shore Environmental has been demonstrating the power of innovative engineering in providing financially beneficial solutions to the environmental challenges facing manufacturers around the globe. Ship and Shore Environmental has been a strong advocate for their clients and the manufacturing industry in general. Ship and Shore Environmental's vast technical know-how, coupled with their involvement in creating new guidelines and regulations set forth by various governmental agencies, has put them in a unique position to save their clients millions of dollars over the years. Ship and Shore Environmental is your source for innovative engineering design, flawless fabrication, turnkey integration of air pollution abatement equipment, heat recovery systems, and overall plant optimization services. So Anusha, what was in your background that made you become an entrepreneur? Was that in your mind when you were young and studying? I mean, you know, people, or did that just evolve? Well, uh, good morning to you and thank you so much for having me on board with wonderful panelists. Um, I, I, I like to uh, attribute that to maybe a sense of entrepreneurship that I always had. However, as I was going to school, to university studying and eventually working for a very, very large reputable EPC firm, Fleur Daniel, I always thought behind my head, what if I was able to do something in my own field on my own? So the sense of entrepreneurship was there, but working in a very large um, 
chemical, petrochemical oriented because of my background. I, I could never put my hands or fingers on it till I stumbled across the environmental side of my studies and the environmental side of the overall picture. What would it be like if I was able to have a positive impact rather than building power plants or nuclear plants or... Oh, the reverse of what you were doing in a company. I have to tell you, being a woman, at times you get messages from um, unbelievable places and locations. And I used to have bad dreams about some of the projects I was involved with. And um, not being able to answer to myself, um, what am I doing? So I think that coupled with the questions and the sense of entrepreneurial that I had eventually led me to establish the company. Um, what was your training? What did you study in school? Um, I, uh, I'm a chemical engineer, so I did study chemical engineering and I always had, uh, I was very fond of chemistry and all that it evolved um, around the subject matter. And, um, while I was working at Fleur Daniel, I had the opportunity of taking um, MBA courses um, there, which led me to the business side of things a little bit more. And um, I did practice as a chemical engineer while working at Fleur. And eventually after that, I had a period that I um, became more involved on the environmental side and started working in that field and found it much more fulfilling in terms of being able to have a good impact, um, not only locally, but worldwide eventually, of being able to clean the air and removing all the pollutants and the chemicals and um, all that there was that was really harmful, not only to humans, but to, to, to everything live on the planet. Well, um Tell me about your parents. I mean, who had the biggest impact on you? There are not many Iranian girls, at, you know, uh, who aspire to become uh, engineers, let alone chemical engineers. Uh, was it your dad, your mother? Who pushed you in that direction? I have to, I have to say they were both very loving and very caring and very supportive in order for uh, parents to let their 14-year-old daughter just leave the country because I had the um, ambition of wanting to continue education and come abroad for studying. This was before the revolution took place. Um, it, was, it was brave of them, um, much more than bravery on my side. Um, my mother was very instrumental in the sense that she always said, as a girl, don't ever let anyone tell you, you can't do it. You could do anything you want to and you put your mind to it um, as long as you have the brains. And they were both very supportive of um, education. You have to make sure you have higher education and studies in order to be able to get where you want to in life. Where did you get the funding for, for the business? I mean, it's one thing to aspire to be an entrepreneur. It's another thing to actually make that happen. Um, the way the business came about, as you mentioned briefly, was an existing business. It was a fabrication facility, which I had joined in order to bring engineering know-how and design and um, capabilities. However, I had an opportunity literally overnight, the existing business owner was not educated, was not in the field and came in one day says, I don't understand any of this and I'm closing down the company. So I had to pull every penny I had in my 401k. <laughs> and um, I decided that, you know, if this is the one time I'm going to put all my heart and soul and investment into something, this should be it. So that's where I did it. And I really feel good about the fact that I did it with my own savings. And um, that was the seed money for a lot of it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Anusha. Everyone, Anusha Osguian. Thank Let you. me now introduce our second panelist. Uh, it's Patricia Marks, or Patty Marks, as we call her. She is the CEO of New World Van Lines, 
Um, and the title tells you exactly uh, what it does. Um, she is the chairman of the board and she's been, she's, you know, worked in this company for 40 years. And basically, uh, it's a business that transports people, things, equipment all, all, all over the United States. She's from Illinois. So let us show you the video of her business. 1919 would see Michael Marks start a one truck moving company called Economy Movers. Edward Marks, son of Michael, knew the potential of the business and in 1953, Edward and his wife Shirley set out to forever change long distance relocation. With an unwavering commitment to quality and a unique approach to moving, the family business soon became the corporate success story that is New World Van Lines. Shirley's leadership grew the company, gaining ultimate recognition in 1999 when New World became certified as a women's business enterprise by the WBE National Council. Serving as the largest independent van line specialized in corporate relocation, New World continues to prosper under the leadership of Chairman and Treasurer Patty Marks. Relentlessly committed to quality, New World became the pinnacle standard for corporate relocation. With 16 New World service centers, eight additional subsidiaries, New World International, hundreds of fleet vehicles, and over 700 employees, New World Van Lines consistently delivers high quality service to clients around the globe. When headed in a new direction, New World Van Lines will take you there. Patty, I'm just so delighted to hear that last year you had won the 2019 Women's Business Enterprise National Council Award, the Rising uh, Entrepreneur Award. That's quite a distinction. So uh, my same question to you as I did to Anusha, how did you get started? What was, what was your plan when you were younger? Was this in your mind, being chairman of the board of a company? This was not a plan in my mind at the time. Um, it, the plan in my mind when I grew up was I wanted a different life than I was growing up in. So um, I what was have, that life? It was a, it was um, you know uh, I had a father that really didn't uh, support and a mother that my mother died when I was seventeen. Uh, my father didn't really support any of um, any of my life really. Uh, so I just knew that I needed to be and wanted to be, strive to be something better than, than that. Um, didn't know what it was going to be, but when um, I was just trying to decide to go to college, uh, he decided to sell the home that we were living in after my mother died, and I could not go to college. So I started out in banking. I got a job as a bank teller and then I did several positions there. My final position there was actually training. I wrote a training manual for tellers. And then I married my husband and married into uh, this amazing business that we, we run today. Um, we celebrated our 101 years old, as the video said. And um, my husband and my, my father-in-law actually, uh, and my mother-in-law were my mentors in my life, much more so than my parents were. Uh, uh, they, they, I believed in whatever they told us to do. We didn't question them. My father-in-law said, move to St. Louis and run our office there. And, and we did. And that's when I moved, started into the moving business. And from there, I just proceeded to, and then we moved to New Jersey. We lived in New Jersey for 12 years. Now we're back in the corporate office after my father-in-law passed away. It uh, was an amazing, and it, it continues to be an amazing journey. And it was one of those things that we just did whatever my husband and I did whatever we needed to do to make the business and the company grow. So I've covered pretty much all facets of uh, our, our industry of our business, um, been in, involved in all of the departments. I've done sales, I've done estimates, I've done, I've moved furniture. I actually did go on the trucks with him um, and move people uh, several times in our early years. And uh, now i um, you know, we're proud to be bringing on the fourth generation, which I have my two daughters are now involved in the business as well. Were you an only child? No, I had two older siblings. And are you the only one who moved in this direction? What did they do? Uh, he, pretty much. My brother is, is the oldest and he's done many different jobs. He didn't have that same ambition. I, you know, can't explain why. My sister actually, um, one of the, the, there are seven Marx children. 
uh, five boys and my sister is actually married to one of the other partners in the company. And um, she's got married at 18, had her first baby at 19, never worked, stayed home, raised her children. And it does n- knows nothing about the company. Um, wow. And, yeah. So she supports her husband and, and actually her children, three or four or four children are involved in the business as well. But uh, she, she doesn't, you know, she chose to raise her and dedicate her life to her children. What's the biggest challenge in uh, <clears throat> having a family owned company? Um, I'm sure <laughs> as with any family, that's not always easy, but when business is involved, I'm sure there were challenges. Yes, definitely. There were originally seven of the seven children were involved in the business. And over the years, uh, situations have risen that, uh, um, you know, they've all they've been bought out now. And it remains the four of us, myself and my uh, my three brother in laws. And um, um, we still uh, get together um, more some because they're spread out across the United States now but we're still very close to them. Um, we normally have a big family gathering at Christmas here at my house, uh, but this year is gonna be the first time in 25 years we won't be able to do that. So uh, but we, do, we they talk to each other, um, you know, they're, it's all civil, it's all very uh, nice, but you know, some, are, some of them are closer, we're closer to some than others. Obviously my sister and her husband, one of the brother, Ed, uh, we're very, very close to. Well, thank you. You gave us a window into what it means to be in a family enterprise. Uh, so there you go. Uh, thank you, Patty. Thank we'll you. We'll talk to you later. Okay, now um, our third panelist comes from Turkey, uh, where it is early evening. She is Aytul Erçil, and she is co-founder and CEO of a company called Vispera. And basically, and I hope I'm not murdering this iTool, uh, it's, a, it's a company that develops software that enables um, retail and supplier companies to track inventory uh, and to do something about it in a very short period of time. Um, she is also an angel investor. Uh, so she's invested in other enterprises and she has you know, owned and sold other companies. She was named by Vuv Clico as um, one of their high impact female entrepreneur of the year. She was Microsoft's woman leader in information technologies. And she also was given the Ernst & Young, the EY Startup of the Year Award among others. So let us show you the video of her company. Welcome. Welcome, Aytul. You know, when we had the Global Summit of Women in Istanbul a few years ago, I was astounded to meet so many women who run their own businesses, running big enterprises. So Aytul, where did you <clears throat> get that start? I mean, did you always want to own your own business? What was your training? Irene, I was as far from entrepreneurship as can be. I was very academically oriented, always top of my class. I did double major in undergraduate in electrical engineering and math, and then did a PhD in applied math at Brown University. But one of the things that changed my mind is when I started working at GM Research Labs in Michigan. 
Working at GM uh, made me realize the importance of applying research results to solve business problems. So this is really when I uh, changed. Uh, and when I returned to Turkey in 1988, uh, I became a faculty member at the university I graduated from for 13 years. And uh, I was doing a lot of applied work there, but they were not being applied because as a university, our job was not creating products. We were doing the R&D, uh, creating a prototype, but it just stayed there. This is right. when I realized that there should be a company that takes the work of the uh, university and turn it into a product. And this is where I started my first company, which I sold to a German company later in 2013. Uh, and then I started my new company. So I became a serial entrepreneur. Well, I have to tell you, I came from academia. There are not many academics with the courage to start an enterprise. Uh, so what move, I mean, you, are you still teaching? Did you have to give up tenure and your position at the university in order to be a successful entrepreneur and focus on that? Um, actually, I uh, continued doing both for many years. Uh, I became a full professor and I was really doing double job, working 80 hours a week, uh, trying to do both of them in the best way I can. Uh, but I just quit two years ago. Um, I think it's enough. I said I uh, it's, uh, I mean, I've published enough papers. Yeah, it's uh, sufficient. I did all I could do there. Well, um, were, were you the eldest in your family? Were there other siblings? Um, uh, I had an older sister, uh, but she didn't go to university and she didn't work. So we had very different lives. I was the only one in my family who went to university. Oh, my goodness. So who was the influence, the father, the mother? I mean, how did you end up, you know, looking at engineering or? Um, I always uh, liked math and science. I mean, those were my strongest topics. And uh, when I uh, was studying, I mean, there was not even computer engineering at the time. So this is why I started studying electrical engineering. And I just loved it. I just loved working with computers. So I decided to continue. Now, who supported your early business? I mean, you know, it's not easy to find um, funding. Okay. That's usually the biggest problem for most women entrepreneurs. Actually, uh, when I started, the entrepreneurship in Turkey was at its infancy. There was no angel investors. There were no VCs. And I didn't have money, so it was really extremely difficult. I mean, if I uh, knew what it would take, I wouldn't do it, I think, at, uh, going, looking back now. Uh, so we were just doing projects. We were doing, uh, we were barely uh, managing, you know, not growing really, just a few people. Um, so th this is really how, how it started. It was a very difficult period. Well, I don't think any entrepreneur would ever say that it was easy. <laughs> That's an true. easy ride to starting and an easy ride to maintaining. So That's no. Um, so uh, what did what was the biggest challenge that you saw as you decided to become an entrepreneur and moving further away from academia? Well, the biggest challenge was the cash flow. As I said, there was no uh, investment investment infrastructure in Turkey at the time. So uh, biggest challenge, uh, another big challenge was uh, convincing uh, companies uh, that a high-tech startup can come out of Turkey. I mean, this is both in Turkey and outside of Turkey. Uh, it was actually harder uh, to work with companies in Turkey uh, because it was really very unusual uh, to have a high-tech company from Turkey at the time. Well, Especially you have to be a woman. Yes, a woman in an industry that they didn't understand at that time, you're a you're a real pioneer. Um, do you have children? Yes, I have two children. Uh, and they see this model mother. Well, one lives in New York. <laughs> one lives in New York. The other lives in Peru right now. Uh, and what are they doing? I mean, you've been you've been quite a role model for any family. Um, well, uh, the one in New York, uh, she's a teacher. Uh, and she loves to work with children. So Good. she found the job of her life. And the one in Peru, uh, she's, she has a website where she's selling Peruvian stuff to globally. And she's making more money than I do now, actually. <laughs> uh, 
but she's also learning a lot, uh, dealing with local people, learning the medicine there, learning the, you know, uh, all the cultures. Well, you gave them the courage to be adventurous. So yeah. thank you. Thank as you. I guess they're happy. That's what I want. Yes. And that's very important. So I'm glad your happiness lay in entrepreneurship. So thank you, Aitul. So let me introduce our last but not least panelist. She is from France, Stephanie Cardo. And 20 years ago, she started a business called To Do Today. Um, actually, she had enterprises before that, but the one I want you to focus on. It is a company that developed programs um, that promoted the well being of employees of many companies. Um, she became very successful and expanded to Switzerland and then to US and Canada. Uh, her clients have included Microsoft or Carrefour, the um, supermarket company chain, uh, as well as PricewaterhouseCoopers. So um, let me show you the video that introduces her business. I should tell everyone that Stephanie is now in the United States, and so she has to uh, have a presence in both countries, uh, even though the majority of the company is still in France. Uh, so Stephanie, uh, how did this idea, because you're a pioneer in that field of well-being, which many companies are now focusing on, where did that idea come to you? Um, I was very privileged uh, 25 years ago. I started working in New York um, at Deloitte and I thought that I was going to be included in, you know, an accounting team or a consulting team or international tax, which was one of my backgrounds. And they, so that was 1994. And they asked me to be part of a team that was going to launch the uh, Women's Initiative Diversity Community Participation Programs. And that's where I realized that um, some major companies were actually starting to pay attention to their human capital um, and that they were wondering how, you know, the change, the forthcoming change in terms of workforce strategies linked to new generations getting onto, into the workforce, um, more women, more diversity. But they knew that something had, gonna, you know, would change. Um, and I figured mm, there might be an opportunity to bring more care and more attention and, and boost engagement of people uh, by bringing services. And then I moved back to France and that's where I was. <laughs> um, I had lost the uh, habit of leaving in the morning to go to the office and everything is closed and you come back at night and everything is closed and all stores are closed on Sundays. And I'm like, when do I ever take care of, you know, the nitty gritty and how do I put food on the table if everything's always shut down? So I was trying to reconcile um, the need for services and make it into something that could serve the purpose of um, HR strategies for my clients. So give an example of a program that you developed for a company, for instance, um, that a company so needed. Okay, so you have companies, for example, who will tell you, um, we need to bring more women into the workforce. We also have to address the needs of several generations, and we don't really know how to reach out to them and to kind of make sure that, um, you know, they, they, they are fully engaged. So to me, it's a journey. But to be engaged, it's not something you, you know, you just tell people, like, be engaged, feel good. That's not how it works. 
First, we bring uh, concierge-like services, time-saving, give us your dry cleaning, let us do, you know, let us run your errands, let us repair your smartphone, whatever, uh, so that you can be freed from constraints and you can focus on something else. The second part of the program has to do with well-being and wellness as a whole, because a little bit like, you know, in the plane, they tell you in case the cabin gets you pressurized, First, put the mask on yourself before you help someone, someone else. So your first duty is towards your health and your well-being. So we bring you know, the hairdresser, the beautician, the chiropractor, the sophologist, the light therapy, the fitness centers to the workplace so that people can have that useful break. Um, and then we move on to a life of engagement and we organize on site and in the digital sphere some um, events that could be community participation event, can, can be um, uh, do it yourself events, meet some colleagues, support entrepreneurs um, that relay the, the, the corporate culture of the, uh, of the client. So it's both on site and from a distance. Well, that's quite, that requires a lot of creativity. And it, it looks like there's a streak of that in you. So what did you study when you were younger? I mean, this wasn't it. <laughs> no, absolutely no. <laughs> um, I, so I, I, I have a, a master in uh, political science and then I went to business school. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting because I feel like there's been a sort of a red link uh, throughout my life because even though I studied um, business, my final exam, my oral examination at Sciences Po in particular, um, I pick up the, uh, the, the, uh, the topic that was in the box mark, finance, economics, business. And it was, um, what is the uh, social responsibility of a corporation? And that was in 1992. So, you know, some, somewhere along the line, it, it was meant to be. You were ahead of the ball game. I mean, that's exactly what companies are thinking of right now. You know, CSR is a big topic. So were there entrepreneurs in your family? I mean, how did you? <laughs> uh, my dad is an entrepreneur. My mom is an entrepreneur. Uh, my husband is an entrepreneur. My kids are micro entrepreneurs, as you well know. So yeah, it, can, it runs in our blood. But it doesn't mean that we were meant to become entrepreneurs. It's just that it was an option and it was, it seemed sort of, you know, natural at the time, um, you know. Natural. People, Entrepreneurship isn't natural for a lot of people. No, I, I, yeah, I know that. But, you know, um, I think I was very, very privileged to be raised in a family where uh, my great grandmother uh, back in Tunisia was uh, working and my grandmother was working and my mother was working as um, lawyers or judges or um, entrepreneurs for my mom. So women in my family have always been self-employed or um, entrepreneurs and my great grandfathers and grandfathers and father, they married those women knowing that they would be working. Um, so I come from a tradition where women can do whatever they choose to do. You were privileged. I was very privileged. Yes. Uh, and I should just tell people that her mother owns a very successful art gallery in Paris. So there you have it. <clears throat> what a stellar group uh, we have in front of us. Uh, women who have created their own futures, created their own uh, concentration in terms of entrepreneurship. So not everyone was impervious to what happened uh, during this pandemic. So let me ask all of you, what was the impact on your business of this global health crisis? Uh, and how did you maintain your visibility and viability as a company during this difficult time? Um, for some of you, this was a good time. For some of you, it was a bad time. Uh, but overall, it was no not no impact. So let me begin with Anusha. Well, upon uh, realizing the, uh, the shock that came through um, and uh, in, in, in a matter of a week or two, learning that we have to shut down and we are not able to uh, continue business as usual, um, and right before the shutdown came in California, um, naturally I had heard about 
the virus and what was going on because we do have plants in China and I had heard about what was going on in China. Um, my thought immediately went to what can be done. We are in the clean air business. We are in the environment in which we try to remove the pollutants and all of that. So what else can we do um, to stay alive, to uh, keep going, um, which gave birth to a particular design of a product that we have used in the past uh, for various types of applications like wastewater plants and cleaning the water and so on and so forth by um, use of ozone or activated oxygen. And we uh, worked on that as an R&D and came up with designs and a prototype that were able to utilize that same concept and apply it in cleaning the air in enclosed offices and spaces to get rid of any pollutants, any aftermath of viruses, um, germs, microbes, whatever else, and um, launch that um, as a side business to Ship and Shore Environmental. The name of the product we called Corozone, and uh, we are actively pursuing that. Um, however, one of the uh, main driving point behind having to come up with something was the fact that we are an essential business to all the essential businesses. Um, uh -huh. So I knew that we were not able to just easily shut down and not come to work. We have been open every single day since then, um, very carefully with utilization of the product, as I mentioned, to make sure all of the people that chose to come into the office were well protected. And we do have a manufacturing facility that is and was delivering equipment to a lot of the manufacturers that needed to have their operations going 24 seven, they could not shut down. People that are in the food processing, people that are in the packaging side, packaging of food, packaging of pharmaceuticals, packaging of all sorts. So um, this really gave us an opportunity to put a lot more focus on something that was much needed and bring it to the forefront of um, the industry as a product. And we are now moving with that product as well to maybe hopefully help schools to open up um, safely and a lot of other um, closed venues that just don't know how to go back into a closed building after it's been shut down for a while. And the goal has been to get rid of um, our, our purpose has always been to not have so much chemicals at, at hand that you are constantly polluting. That's for personal side as well as um, breathing side. So, so, um, so the, the pandemic gave the company an opportunity to create a new product line as well as to continue functioning. So basically the, you're, you stabilized during the pandemic. You didn't see a, a downturn, right? Uh, yes, we did not see a downturn. We actually were very busy with a number of other related type uh, projects, as well as the fact that a lot of the businesses that needed to stay open needed our services more than ever. Um, You're very lucky and very quick. <laughs> uh, Patty, was that your experience with new, new World Van Lines? What happened when the pandemic struck? Well, going into it and... and, and all of the hoopla going, uh, deciding what was going to happen. Uh, we weren't sure we were gonna be considered an essential business or not. So that was our, our first initial shock. Um, and then when we got the word that yes, uh, because what we do is go into uh, people's homes and pack and load their household goods and relocate them around the world. Um, and so we weren't sure what that was gonna bring. And a lot of but things came out of it. One of them was uh, protect, protecting our employees. Um, we were considered an essential business, so moves still kept happening. Kind of shocked us. We weren't sure people were going to move during the pandemic, but they have. Um, then came the safety of our crews. We had to keep our men uh, and our helpers uh, and our employees safe. So coming, protecting them with uh, uh, masks and shields when they, and gloves when they went into people's homes. Uh, became our main priority. 
We also reacted quickly enough. Unfortunately, prior to the right prior to the pandemic, we increased the bandwidth within our company within our corporate office. So we within a week had 90% or 90% of our people off site and up and running. So we reacted quickly and um, put some policies in place and um, uh, have, you know, we're going to end up approximately 20% down, which we are, we are extremely fortunate and happy to um, be able to say that. Yeah, 20% down isn't bad. Um, right. Did any employees get sick, any drivers during this period? Very few. Fortunately, very few. Um, less than 10 out of, uh, um, well, just under 500 employees. So we were very, very fortunate. Um, we've got a core group of people in our corporate office. There's 30 to 35 people. Whenever um, anybody comes in from the outside, our, our movers are, and it's mainly our drivers that are traveling the world that we were, you know, traveling the U.S. that we were wor worried about. And uh, it's been less than 10, literally. We've gone into homes where, where people have, uh, we went to one home in particular and the lady answered the door, our men are masked and gloved. And she said, uh, I'm here, my husband won't be, he has COVID. So we, we went, our crew was said, okay, thank you very much. And they turned around, went back to the truck, called us and said, okay, we're gonna have to. And because we do work for corporations, we, we can't just say, see you later. We've got to contact our corporate customer and say, hi, we have a problem here. And you know they were very kind. We rescheduled when it was safe to go back into the home. But our men, I have to say, hands down, were were our saving grace. Is that they were? Uh, it's not easy, especially in the summertime when it's 90 degrees outside, wearing a mask and a shield over your face. Um, so, but they've they stayed safe. They protected our customers, and we really appreciate that. I think it was it was a it was. They wanted to work as well, Patty. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, nobody wanted to be out of work. So uh, a bit of a downturn, some downturn, but not some so downturn. bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, part of so, our business is international. So that's the big part that because nobody's moving internationally at the moment. So it's one of the bigger parts of it. Um, iTool. Uh, I would think your business would prosper during the pandemic. Well, uh, initially we were negatively affected. Uh, last two years we've been going around 20, 25% month on month. And initially our revenues declined by like 12% in March, 46% in April. Uh, so we had a big decline. We didn't actually lose any customers, but several customers froze the projects until they understood what was going on, you know, because they were all in a panic. Uh, but we're working in 18 countries and we saw the advantage of that. Some companies continued their operations during the pandemic. For example, operations in Israel, Brazil, Germany, Poland, they didn't stop at all. So that was actually uh, helpful for us. Uh, we utilized this period uh, of reduced project activity to emphasize our digital marketing activities and reassess our product strategy. We started a webinar series called Re Retail where we interviewed C-level executives in the retail industry. And over 13,000 people watched these videos and our LinkedIn followers increased by 59%. So we saw that these activities really helped increasing our visibility. And we also followed what's going on in the industry very closely. Uh, we followed uh, many webinars and we saw, for example, there was 500, over $500 billion in out of stock of products due to pandemic. And these, information was useful in explaining our value proposition better. So we think in the long run, the pandemic will actually help us uh, because companies realize the importance of, retailers realize the importance of digitization. And now uh, we see that really this is going to uh, help our, uh, to our benefit. But we uh, use this period to for product reassessment. Uh, before the pandemic, most of our development team was busy with uh, dealing with customer demands and didn't have much extra time for developing new products. And pandemic gave us the opportunity to speed up the developments in our pipeline. For example, we knew that e-commerce was gaining speed and we were talking about uh, the connection of online and offline shopping trends and what we can do there. Uh, 
but we just did, didn't have the time to develop new products there. But during this uh, period, uh, we uh, saw the trends uh, towards e-commerce increase dramatically. Uh, and some things like click and collect, buy online. Yeah. That's actually a trend that applications increased. Right. Yeah. So we saw this as a so, great potential and we developed new products uh, to help uh, in these areas. So it was actually an opportunity. That's uh, sort of Definitely. like in Anusha's case, developing a new product line okay. as a consequence. So okay. Stephanie, um, your business depended on uh, being there physically for employees. What did you have to do to adjust? Well, first of all, um, I need to replace COVID in the context of crisis after crisis after crisis uh, for our small business over the past uh, five years. In 2015, the business was thriving and 70% uh, of um, uh, new buildings and uh, top 40 companies in France were equipped with services. Um, we were cash full, we were profitable, so it was great. That's when I decided that um, I needed to get out of my comfort zone and uh, go international. So in 2015-16, we acquired a, a small company in Switzerland and decided to launch North America from scratch. Now, needless to say that this put a strain on our you know, resources and on the team, and it was a lot of um, redefining the service offer, redefining the process, streamlining the organization. So that was pretty uh, tense. And then in 2017, I decided that, um, you know, I could tell that the market was going to was going to shift. And I said, we need to rethink the uh, service offer, the marketing, the pitch, be more less B2B2C and more B2C2B. Uh, and then it ended. So that was 2018. And then we decided that we needed to um, in, in, in invest in a um, um, technology and in a, in a information system um, that would be an ERP and we, you know, redesign the uh, digital platform to better serve our end users. Um, and so that's what we did for a year and a half, um, except that the provider uh, had told us it was gonna take one year and cost X and it took over two years, cost thrice what he had uh, announced and it didn't work. So by the uh, beginning of 2019, we were exhausted, close to death. We didn't know if we were going to survive. Um, the teams were working 24 seven, we were fighting our way through and we you know, spent that entire year um, fighting for survival. And we did because our clients were exceptional all behind us. The teams were, you know, were very resilient. The business model proved to be strong as well as the values. Uh, and by the end of 2019, we had renegotiated the moratorium with the bank, so we were fine. And so we opened 2020 in the notion that the business is growing again, profit is back. Wow, we're going to rest. <laughs> and that's how it is. Yeah. Um, and so the day so was just... Friday, <laughs> Friday uh, March 13th, 12 noon. Um, and that day, for some reason, both my husband and I were working from home. Um, and the kids come in early and they're like, the school is shut down. It's like, what? And then we start getting calls, um, both my husband and my husband understand works in the hospitality industry, does mobile check-in, check-out solutions for hotels. So in between Friday the 13th and uh, Tuesday the 17th, 80% of Laurent's business were shut down and clients. And 100% of my clients had, in, in all four countries, had shut down their office buildings. So there's this short moment where you're like, oh, you're sort of overwhelmed. And then you're back in, you know, warrior mode. What are we going to do? Um, how would you? So the first thing was, it takes a lot from an administrative and financial standpoint. Um, what do we do with our people? Who can be put on furlough? What are the regulations in Canada, in France, uh, in the US, um, in Switzerland? How can we address you know, wh what our people are gonna need? Who's gonna be able to work from home? Who's not gonna be able to work from home? How can we you know, put together a team that's gonna make the business keep going? Um, then the 70% uh, of our revenues come from you know, recurring fees paid by our corporate and real estate clients. How do we maintain that um, flow of revenues if we don't serve the contracts if we're not there on a daily basis. So what did you um, do? What did you decide yeah. to do? 
Give it well, all what that. we decided to do is um, we needed to make sure the activity was still going and that the end users, the employees or the uh, uh, occupants could still use services and that we had something to show that we were going uh, digital. So we decided to accelerate the roadmap in, the, in terms of development of the digital platform and we went to addressing the needs of our people on site as to reaching them out, you know, through um, the app and the, and the web portal. Uh, we also decided that it was a time where we should not try to push the services we usually want to push, that we should ask our clients, our end users, what are your pains? What do you need? How can we help? Because we thought there was more value uh, since you know money was going to be an issue anyway, so at least we should help help our people. So we put a team of concierge on the phone, twenty four seven. You know, again calling people one by one, saying, "What is your situation? How can we help?" And we had the most you know crazy thing. Like even um, a client said he was like you know hushing on the phone. He's like, "My wife is out of cigarettes." Um, just, <laughs> can you do something? You know, so we have the most random. All things. right. So, so you yeah. move the services. So we move the services. The um, and it was very difficult because we have the services that we provide, but they're also all the vendors and independent uh, service providers. So, how do you help um, the uh, you know the dry cleaner? Uh, deliver not in one side, but at home. How do you uh, ask the, the coach, the fitness coach, to go entirely online? How do you do, the, you know, the, uh, the community events? Uh, in you the, had to yeah. reinvent the services. We had to reinvent the whole thing. Yeah. And um, so. the results were pretty, uh, the results were pretty impressive because after, you know, four months of, again, working 24-7 because we had people in North America and people in Europe, and so we could do that from the clock. Uh, we only lost 15% of our billing. That's um, pretty good. So That's we, pretty so good. Actually, 15%, you know, Patty at 20%. Right. So, yeah. so basically what I'm hearing from you and Aito and Anusha, uh, yes, there was a, a sort of a downturn in terms of traditional business, but it gave the opportunity to create new products and to reinvent another way of providing the product. Um, I wanna share with you guys that there was a Nielsen uh, study that showed that there's a trend because of decreased mobility and decreased pocketbooks of going local in terms of both consumers and in terms of supply chain. In other words, people realized having you know products or parts come in from far away is probably not a good idea because there may be another crisis or that your customers need to be able to walk to things. Um, so have you found that to be uh, a trend? Or, I mean, did, did that affect any of your businesses, anybody? Um, I, like to, I like to address that. Um, naturally, what we do, um, not only we're very involved in the local state legislation and all that needs to be done, um, for large manufacturers, industrial facilities, and all of that, but a lot of the um, a lot of the equipment that is being really manufactured in our own facility has components coming from all over. Um, we are a U.S. manufacturer, and we try to use U.S. products as much as possible. But there are certain things that there is no way that you could get in unless it's coming from various countries. So we did learn to substitute and became more creative in manufacturing some of the components and parts ourselves, mm. where it may have taken a little bit longer or it may have taken a little bit more um, in-house labor time. But we, we tried to do that because we were under the gun as far as time will go to make some of these um, deliveries. Um, we were very careful about maneuvering our people to various locations as well. Um, naturally, we never wanted to put anyone um, in, in any danger, but we do service um, everyone in U.S. as well as other countries. Naturally, travel abroad stopped, and we used local China for China, Thailand for Thailand, India. Precisely. Yeah. So that's but as local it could be but in us we did and we had an emergency for an essential business that 
my guys were just amazing. They came in and they offered, they said, you know what, rather than flying, what we would do is we'll get in a truck, um, a service truck, and two of them drove together for about 15 hours to get to a client site because they needed to go and help them out with an equipment that needed to be running the whole time in order for the end user to be able to produce because they're a 24 seven operation. Well, so the human side of things and people that really wanted to work, people that really cared came out. And that was one of the nicest things I observed during the pandemic. You, you, see, the, you see the better side of a lot of people that really want to get out there and do whatever they can. And with Good. all the respect to some people that would not move an inch no matter what. So you have, you have all of that to deal with and it is the human side of things. Right, uh, which any CEO has to confront. Anybody else on the whole theory of going local? Yes, we, we have 16 service centers across, across the United States and we are used to uh, purchasing in bulk as much as we can um, for each of those locations. Well, um, we swiftly changed that First of all, we couldn't get any PPE uh, in bulk or in main purchases. So we had to tell our 16 service centers, go out and find whatever you can find and buy it, whatever it costs, it, we have to have it. Um, the other thing is, is our number one spend is packing material. And um, we used to buying in bulk and stocking inventory in our warehouses. So we completely switched that and went to local vendors paying a little bit more money, but we've also re reduced the inventory that we're holding. And uh, that made a big difference for our bottom line as well. So it was a, a, a balancing act, but, and many other things, but it, it, that we've gone locally for us, you know, and simple things like dish soap, Lysol, uh, the sanitizers that we couldn't get from anybody um, trying to purchase for all of our 16. So they, we, we went and did definitely did local, had to. Yeah. Had to adjust. And I think it's going to be a remaining trend. Um, for um, Itul and, and Stephanie, what do you, you know, everybody talks about the reset economy. What do you see as challenges going forward to your business or just the economy as a whole as people who are playing in the marketplace, just um, quickly. Sure, well, first of all, I want to say that since we are a software uh, company, we were not affected uh, by these uh, in trends. Uh, we see a, 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 the pandemic as an opportunity for the business. Uh, so studies show that there are five to 10% less uh, loss from traditional store visits if the customer journey is not optimized. So all these new paradigms in uh, shopping uh, are really a potential for us. So uh, we plan to give higher emphasis to our uh, fixed camera solution where we can monitor the store inventory in real time and help the retailers meet these new demands. Um, we're also working with other electronic retailers and pharmaceutical companies, so expanding to other verticals in retail. You have a good future in the reset economy is what I'm seeing. Stephanie. I see a lot of positives uh, coming out of this uh, pandemic, uh, even though obviously there are some challenges. Um, one is the, uh, the, I think people realize how um, important and more important than ever solidarity um, has become and solidarity internally, but also as part of your ecosystem. And I will give, I'll give two very short examples. Um, how to do today, usually March is the bonus month. Um, so this year, we, you know, I placed it in front of the people, of, of the teams and said, do we give bonuses uh, or do we maintain everybody's uh, salary at 100% no matter how long half of the team are going to be on furlough? And they all chose to give up on bonuses so that everyone could be treated the same way. Um, I think that was part of, you know, this lack of egoism and um, this openness to share with others who are less fortunate. Um, I think that's at our level, we saw it, and at our client's level, we saw it, and we saw a lot of big companies, uh, you know, acting the responsible way and saying, we're going to be um, paying your contracts, or we're going to help you go through this as part of the ecosystem. I think this is something we should build on, you know, this empathy um, and this feeling that 
hey, listen, I was on the, you know, I was on a Zoom call with the CEO of one of my top clients and his kids were playing in the background. That has to totally change our perspective on the world. The other thing is, after the 2008 crisis, um, everyone was, you know, in, in the opinion that we should make big changes. But the approach that was taken was, um, let's go step by step. And we went so slowly as a, you know, global community that basically nothing changed. Right now, what we need is to reinvent um, the world, the ecology, you know, the, the sustainability, the financial markets, the accounting standards. Uh, we need to stop thinking short term and we need to address the long term um, issue. Wonderful. I think we're going to be held by that because no one, everyone agrees that coronavirus or you know, coronavirus like pandemics is here to stay and it's going to affect us in the long term. So now we need to be out for the long term. I agree. Um, and on that note, actually, reinvention has been echoed by each of your stories. Uh, the quickness uh, with which all of you found a way not only to create another product, but create another way of doing this, providing similar services, um, but in a different way, I think was echoed by all four of you. And what I also see are four very strong women who um, respond quickly. And I think that's something that our viewers uh, would also respond to. So let me now open for questions. Um, I, I think uh, there's a question from Mexico. Uh, is Mexico, I, I thought I saw a question from Mexico. Uh, we're open for questions. Hi. Hi. Hi, this is Charlene Ramos. I am a real estate immigration and business attorney. And I am the secretary member of the board of the Business Women's Association, owners AMHE in Mexico. So, and I would like to ask the panel, um, if you could mention one aspect of your national economy that on the countries that you were doing business that you are able to identify and that you use in your benefit for your business. Anyone take a stab at that? A facet of their economies, I'm trying to understand the question, a facet their, of their economies that enabled them to? Yes, like if on the countries that they're doing business, if they were able to identify something in their economies that was particular to that country that they were able to identify and use to the benefit of their own companies. Ah, okay. I'll take a stab at that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, mention um, along the side of what Stephanie was mentioning um, about thinking globally and um, the solidarity, this pandemic really did show us all that at the end of the day, we're all the same. We're all humans susceptible to what is going on. And no matter where we are and what we do, we're all um, perhaps <clears throat> could be a victim of it. Um, so in our business, which is doing air pollution control and cleaning the environment, cleaning the air, um, the opportunity had come in China because of knowing that the air in China was extremely polluted. It was hard for not only all the people there, that even people that traveled to China to be able to even breathe regular air. So what we did was we opened up offices in China in order to um, solve the problem that China has with respect to air pollution. So in terms of other economy and other countries, uh, we started doing work in other countries and manufacturing in the area to help the climate and the people in the, in the region. I would That's think you have to do that. I mean, you know, how could you address air pollution in one place and have it be similar to another? Um, there's a question from Nabo. Good day, Irene, and good day, ladies. This is so exciting to be here with you today. So I'm Christina Morales-Heaney. I am the current board chair 
for the National Association of Women Business Owners. And Irene, like the Global Summit of Women, we too are celebrating a milestone, our 45th year anniversary. Congratulations. I, yes, thank you. And congratulations to the Global Summit of Women. I call San Antonio, Texas my home. And the question I'm going to ask, I'd like to address to each of our panelists. So we're in this current situation. We all find ourselves in this situation globally. So we may even see more women decide to leave academia or the corporate world, or maybe a woman business owner now who's got to totally pivot and start, close her business and start a new business. So what would be the biggest piece of advice that you could give, give a woman in a situation such as this? Advice to a woman possibly thinking about leaving entrepreneurship or at least the business she currently leaving has? the corporate world, leaving a teaching position or possibly a woman that already has been a woman business owner, but she needs to shut that business down and start a new one. So what I would love from these amazing women to hear what one bit of advice they could share with the woman in a situation like that. Okay, well, Stephanie faced this, so go. <laughs> Um, I started to do today, uh, September 9th, um, 2001. So two days later, the world collapsed. Um, and it's actually a good moment to get started in a new journey or in a new entrepreneurial journey in particular, because it's the moment where um, you can innovate, you can try, uh, you can invent new ways and new things. Uh, and be ready when the market picks up again. And during that time, bigger competitors uh, are not, you know, are focusing on their own um, activities and they're less in the innovation sphere. So I actually think those moments are great moments to innovate and launch new um, business. Anybody else? Any uh, quick well, piece of stuff. advice? Anusha? Oops, sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Anusha. Anusha right. and then Aitul. Um, I... Um, I've always been a big believer of um, getting started in something that you either have passion for, you have to love waking up every morning and looking forward to it. It doesn't matter what it is, even if you need to make a cup of coffee and start a cafe for a local community. And um, you have to have passion and love for what it is or rely on your strengths in the areas of your um, educational background, what your community needs, and just respond to the demand that is out there. So I think those are some of the key ingredients for someone wanting to start a new business. And it doesn't have to start very big. It has to just get started. But you want to do it for the right reasons. And that is a big question. And I think you have to really internalize that question. Why is it that I want to do this? Because if you're tired of where you are, it may not be enough ingredients to get you to the next level. But Very if true. something is calling you and you have a calling for it and you see a need, it may even be babysitting needs because we're, as women, have, are very nurturing. So I think that is that would be the biggest question and it'll eventually lead you to the right places. Thank you. I too. Uh, one of the problems with many women is lack of confidence. So I would just say, uh, find your strength, trust yourself. And if I can do it, they can too. Well, <laughs> uh, that's a tall order coming from I too, who is juggling uh, professorships with uh, a vital new business. Did you want to add, Patty? Sure. Uh, just that um, look forward, move forward, don't look backwards, uh, have confidence in yourself, uh, set a goal, and um, just take your passion where, where it goes. Um, it's about, it, it's about um, believing in yourself and, and, and make, being able to make changes and make changes quickly that will move you forward. I agree. 
Uh, our last question to Illinois. Thank you, Irene, and thank you for this outstanding panel. I really do feel that we should all give each other a round of applause. My name is Claudia Freed. I am CEO of EAL Green. We are a reverse logistics nonprofit that converts excess inventory into scholarships for students. My question has to do with risk management, in particular within the context of CSR, corporate social responsibility, which Irene mentioned. And in particular, I would like your thoughts, uh, any of you are qualified to answer this, with a study that I read that the, the pandemic is reprioritizing companies' commitment to the environment, in particular to sustainability. Um, everyone is trying to solve the problem here and now, and somewhat abandoning uh, the long-term goals of the United Nations sustainability goals of a cleaner environment, clean water, uh, social justice. So have you seen either within your companies or with corporate clients, a reprioritization of the commitment to the environment? Thank you. Well, Anusha, this sounds like it's in your <laughs> lane. Um, <clears throat> I know as she was asking the question and I was thinking that every single one of those are the areas that we are trying to reach out to a lot of our existing clients that may have not had this as a part of their corporate social responsibility before. And um, as um, I too was mentioning, we have really uh, created a very large platform on socially and on the web, trying to reach out to a lot of our clients, a lot of the people that we have spoken with in the past, but never had the pleasure of being able to serve directly to bring this at the forefront of their overall thought process for continuing their business. Um, some of the people that are in the essential business, just asking the question, what have you done to make sure that you do take care of the clean air issues, the clean water issues, and how is your corporation affecting the environment in which they are at, because we do work with a lot of companies that are multinational, they're in, all, they're in countries all over the place. Um, and I have to say, more people are really paying more attention to it than they did before. Um, some at least have started adopting the plans and are thinking, how do we do this collectively? Whereas in the past, it was only a matter of economics. Well, we don't have the budget for it. Whereas right now, I think they are realizing in order for them to be able to sustain their growth and their existence or their survival, they need to be thinking about this with that thought in mind. Um, how do we take care of the, the bigger world that we're in? So I am happy to say that there is more of that um, that is felt and seen than ever before. Um, now, if we had the um, administration that supported that as a whole and joined forces with all of the other countries that would eventually um, look at it as a bigger picture, look at our climate change, for example, um, then we would probably be able to march forward a little bit faster. Well, on that hopeful note, <laughs> it's, I am really sorry that we have to end this wonderful dialogue. I have to tell you, during the pandemic, because there was no movement of cars, trucks, people, there was clear air. Uh, in India, they saw the mountains for the first time, you know? So I think people sort of saw very quickly the connection between human activity and a better environment. I do want to applaud this panel. You are all exceptional, terrific in terms of your commitment, your strength, your smarts, your inventiveness. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And thank you all for being part of this uh, incredible journey. Uh, the pandemic is still with us. We will still have challenges going forward for all entrepreneurs worldwide. We will continue this dialogue and I hope you come back and join us. Thank you and goodbye.